I'm Charles Wilson, Senior Principal Engineer at Motional, responsible for cybersecurity development lifecycle practice. This presentation will cover background information about the Autonomous Vehicle Cybersecurity Development Lifecycle, or AVCDL. At the end of August 2021, the International Standard Covering Road Vehicle Cybersecurity Engineering, ISO SAE 21434, was released. This technical standard is the basis for international vehicle regulations in the area of cybersecurity. What does this mean for vehicle development? How are we going to achieve compliance with this standard? I was hired by Motional to look at this very problem. The answer to this question is embodied in the Autonomous Vehicle Cybersecurity Development Lifecycle, or AVCDL for short. Before getting into the details of the AVCDL, let's look at the various elements that led to its creation. First, let's cover some lifecycle basics. At the root of everything are the policies of the company. These are the why. Policies are the motivating factor for everything that the company does. The second element are the processes. They're the what, who, and when of the activities that achieve the policies. Finally, we have procedures, which tell us how a specific process is going to be implemented. A life cycle is the collection of processes that guide how a product is created, used, and eventually disposed of. Next, let's look at the standards and regulations ecosystem in which our life cycle is going to operate. Underpinning all of the standards and regulations is ISO 9001. This is the Quality Management System, or QMS, and acts as the basis for compliance in any regulated industry. Within the automotive realm, the complementary standard is IATF 16949. Within our context, the next relevant standard is ISO 15288. This is the system's development life cycle. It's not actually a life cycle, but rather describes what processes need to be undertaken in the context of systems engineering in order to create a product. The actual implementation of a life cycle is left to the individual organization. Above 15288 is ISO 12207. This is the software development life cycle, and just like 15288, is not actually a life cycle. The processes specified in 12207 are extensions of those specified in the system's development life cycle and are specialized to software development. Next, we have a pair of technical standards specific to the automotive space. The first, ISO SAE 21434, covers cybersecurity engineering for road vehicles. The second, ISO 24089, covers software update. These standards are not an extension of either 12207 or 15288, but rather presume that these two standards are in place in the same way that 15288 presumes that ISO 9000 is in place. Next, we'll switch from technical standards to regulations. In this case, these are the UN regulations governing road vehicles. Specifically, Regulation 155 covering the Cybersecurity Management System, or CSMS, and Regulation 156 covering the Systems Update Management System, or SUMS. These are paired with their underlying technical standards 21434 and 24089, respectively. Atop these two regulations sit another series of regulations, all of which have dependencies upon them. Here we see UN R157, or ALCS, covering auto lane keeping systems. The expectation is that there is a conformance to both R155 and R156. Finally, there's a proposal currently under consideration covering automated driving systems, or ADS, which will also require conformance to R155 and R156. Before creating a life cycle, it's important to ensure that the standards you'll be working with actually have alignment. So let's go through that exercise. Here we see the activities specified in ISO 15288, the system's development life cycle. We can consider this standard in three chunks. Technical processes, requirements through disposal, 
and agreement processes for interactions with suppliers and customers. When we put ISO 12207 next to 15288, we can confirm that it is, as mentioned previously, an extension into the software realm. Where it differs is that what 15288 refers to as transition and validation activities, 12207 refers to as software installation and software acceptance support. Other than that, the activities differ in name only. Let's now add ISO 26262, which covers functional safety for road vehicles. You'll note the introduction of the concept phase. Additionally, the technical processes have been split into management of functional safety and supporting processes. In the middle, the activities are grouped together reflecting the nature of safety within product development. Specifically, integration, verification, and transition phases are grouped together as integration and verification. Also, validation has become production, and the operation, maintenance, and disposal phases are grouped together into a single phase. Finally, we'll add ISO SAE 21434. It resembles 26262, except in the areas of operation, maintenance, and decommissioning. Those areas more closely align with 15288 and 12207's breakdown. Additionally, 21434 is much more specific, saying distributed cybersecurity activities rather than agreement or supporting processes. If you have an organization creating products subject to regulation, you'll need to synchronize your various groups and their activities. You're going to want them to speak a common language. You don't want to have cybersecurity talking about development while everyone else is talking about implementation. So how do you enable multiple groups with disparate nomenclatures to communicate, share information, and have synchronization points without confusion? We'll address this by introducing the Autonomous Vehicle Product Development Lifecycle. The AVPDL is a simple but powerful construct which lays out a set of generic phases and processes. It allows groups to use a common language to clearly communicate with other groups when discussing activities in various phases or processes. We still have the problem that things don't quite line up and we're dividing and grouping various things. But you'll notice that where we are introducing additional separation or grouping, it's across phases that lend themselves to this type of decomposition. For instance, the separation of operations and decommissioning is common among three of the standards and shouldn't cause any great difficulty for those in safety who are using 26262. You'll note that I said that there were processes and phases within the AVPDL. The processes are things which are managed primarily at the organizational level rather than by any one group. Project management, document management, and training are examples of organizational processes. At the bottom, we see supplier processes. These are also primarily managed at the organizational level, but with contributions being made by each of the specific groups. For instance, within the context of 21434, we have to have a cybersecurity interface agreement to go along with the functional interface agreement that exists between the supplier and the customer. This brings us to the lifecycle phases. These activities directly pertain to the creation, operation, and decommissioning of products requiring the coordinated efforts of multiple groups. The choice of divisions is based on what the largest similar activity groupings are. The motivation for the scope of activities in a phase is that you're either going to need a gating activity because there's a dependency on previous phases that would prevent you from moving to the next phase without having verified that you've taken care of everything that you need to in the current one, or in the case of the operation phase, that the activities cannot be otherwise grouped. And so what we see here is that the green phases are fundamentally gating spots for project management where we want to make sure that we've completed all activities across all groups before proceeding. 
We also want to do this because we have to ensure that we have traceability as required within a regulated industry. Traceability will be covered in greater detail later in this presentation. The foundation phase doesn't have a gate because its activities are ongoing throughout the entirety of the product lifecycle. Additionally, once you've created the processes specified in the foundation phase, they can be reused in future products. Similarly, the operations phase isn't gated because operations are ongoing. The activities used to handle issue tracking and fleet management will be the same regardless of the product within the operational phase. All of the same structures and frameworks apply equally. Lastly, decommissioning isn't gated because it can occur at any time and has no other phase dependencies. Individual products are sent in for repair or an entire series may be retired. Now that we've established the phases that we're going to use for this life cycle, let's consider some specific sources that we're going to use in order to determine what the activities in each of these phases are going to be. First and foremost is ISO SAE 21434, the Road Vehicle Cybersecurity Engineering Standard. This is our base technical standard, and it's going to serve as the most important reference used within the creation of the AVCDL. As previously mentioned, ISO 26262, the Road Vehicle Functional Safety Standard, serves as our guide because although we can create an arbitrarily secure product, what we need to do is have enough security to ensure that the vehicle is going to be operating in a safe way without undue impact on functional requirements. Another source from the standard side is UN Regulation 155 dealing with cybersecurity management systems. In the area of best practices, we'll be utilizing the seminal work, the Security Development Lifecycle, developed by Microsoft roughly 20 years ago. A relatively recent but very informative work is the SSDF from NIST. This document, entitled Mitigating the Risk of Software Vulnerabilities by Adopting a Secure Software Development Framework, is a compendium of best practices and has many informative elements which are not collected anywhere else. Rounding out our primary reference documents is NIST Special Publication 800-181, National Initiative for Cybersecurity Education, Cybersecurity Workforce Framework, also called NCWF. It provides a definitive list of all the knowledge, skills, and activities that each worker in the cybersecurity realm needs in order to effectively fulfill their job. Now let's take a look and see how each of these sources inform the construction of the AVCDL. Let's start by taking the AVPDL phases that specify the life cycle and stretch them out linearly. Note the ledge in the lower right corner showing that the foundation elements are in blue, the developmental in green, and the post-developmental in yellow. All other elements in white are general information. Let's start with the MSSDL. As you can see, there's a fairly direct mapping between the MSSDL and the phases as described by the AVPDL. Two deviations are that the requirements phase in the MSSDL specifies activities in both the requirements and the design phases. Additionally, the release phase speaks not only to the release phase in the AVPDL, but also to the foundation phase. The SSDF is a bit less granular, divided into only four topics. These are protecting the software, preparing the organization, producing well-secured software, and respond to vulnerability reports. This material covers everything except for the product release and decommissioning phases of the AVPDL. You'll note in the legend that we use a rounded red rectangle for 26262. There are, however, no processes that speak directly to cybersecurity activities. It's more of an alignment of material. The requirements and design phases are spoken of in the third volume of 26262, the implementation through verification phases in volumes four through six. Finally, 
the release, operation, and decommissioning phases are covered in Volume 7. This brings us to ISO SAE 21434. As you can see, the mapping is a bit of a mess. There are multiple phases that are spoken to by the various clauses within 21434. This is unfortunate, but that's just the way it's structured. As you can see, there are many things which speak to activities which should be addressed in the foundation phase. There are also activities which speak to multiple phases. This makes for the direct usage of 21434 very difficult in terms of implementation. In fact, it speaks to why it's useful to have a life cycle and is the assumption by many of the other standards. Because the life cycle speaks to the direct set of processes that an organization would actually use, as opposed to the way that these are organized from the standpoint of a standards or regulatory document. And here's a quick view to show you all of the sources combined. As you can see, the various sources all contribute something differently, and they all arrange their information in different manners. The AVCDL harmonizes all of this information and in fact provides something that organizations can implement without having to worry about how any of these sources in particular speak to the material. Let's look briefly at how we take one of these standards, specifically ISO SAE 21434, and use it to inform what we should have in the AVCDL. Here's a sheet that was created to bring together the 21434 work products and their specific requirements. Note that there's a column labeled AVCDL phase. This is used to chunk the information and place the specific requirements into the appropriate AVCDL phase buckets. Using the information from 21434 and other sources, a list of phase requirements for the AVCDL was created. These are shown across the top. On the left are the 21434 requirements. What we're able to do then is to show within the field how particular AVCDL phase requirements satisfy particular 21434 requirements. Additionally, we show where we've provided partial support because those requirements are not entirely within the purview of cybersecurity requiring other groups or organizational level inputs. Here's the result, the AVCDL framework. As you can see, from the AVPDL, we have the identified phases for the life cycle. Foundation, Requirements, Design, Implementation, Verification, Release, Operation, and Decommissioning. Within the developmental phases are five phase gates used to synchronize the AVCDL with the other group's life cycles being used in the implementation of the product. As you can see, the foundation phase spans all other phases. We can see why from the contents, training, roles and responsibilities, toolchain support, overall requirements, protection of the code, ensuring release integrity, incident response plan, decommissioning plan, threat prioritization plan, and deployment plan. These are all global level things within the context of cybersecurity and apply at every release of every product. In fact, having and updating them at this level allows us to have uniformity across the product. Within the developmental phases, we find a normal distribution of the processes. In requirements, we have only one. We get more in design, the bulk of our activities are within implementation, Verification looks back on earlier processes, and so matches design roughly. And finally, we have release, where our only processes are final review and archiving. This gives us a sense of where we're going to be putting the bulk of our cybersecurity activities. The last section of the framework contains the post-production phases of operation and decommissioning. Note that in operation, we're doing a lot of work which is related to the operational technologies and also deployment. In decommissioning, we have decommissioning processes, because unlike other groups involved in vehicle lifecycle, we have cybersecurity-relevant material 
in various elements of the vehicle that need to be addressed if the elements taken out of service either for full decommissioning or simply for RMA. Let's take a moment to consider how the AVCDL addresses two major concerns within cybersecurity, those being design deficiencies and implementation defects. A classic way to approach cybersecurity within a product is by assessing the product after it's built. This can be done using traditional penetration testing or earlier in the process with extensions to what would normally be considered compiler features, such as static analysis and dynamic analysis, as well as more sophisticated after-the-fact testing, such as the analog-to-unit testing, fuzz testing. Additionally, you can have secure code reviews alongside traditional functional code reviews. These address implementation defects where the system itself has implemented cybersecurity incorrectly. A more sophisticated approach would allow us to address design deficiencies, where the elements of the system were not designed taking cybersecurity into consideration. Here we look at things like secure design reviews, attack surface analysis, and threat modeling. You'll note that there's a duel to these last two processes in the verification phase, where we perform a threat modeling review and an attack surface analysis review. This allows us to ensure that those deficiencies that were identified in the design phase were in fact corrected in the verification phase. It's a combination of these two approaches which address both design deficiencies and the implementation defects that give us the highest level of certainty that we've managed to attain sufficient cybersecurity rigor. And since this is a life cycle which works within the context of organizations using the V model, the AVCDL can in fact show that this model is addressed. Now having a V on the diagram doesn't really get into how it works, so let's look in a more detailed fashion. Since the AVCDL does not prescribe a particular implementation methodology, an elaboration document has been provided to help those who use this model understand how it relates to the AVCDL. In this case, that elaboration document is entitled Understanding, Verification, and Validation in an AVCDL Context. On the left is a portion of a diagram showing how particular artifacts created in earlier stages are verified in later stages. In this case, we can look at the threat modeling report and attack surface analysis report created in the design phase and then later reviewed in the verification phase. Additionally, you can see how particular downstream activities rely on various upstream activities. The AVCDL can also be applied within the context of a cyclic development implementation. If we take that on a large scale, we go from the requirements through the release and operation in a cycle anchored by the foundation phase, which applies at all times. Finally, we have an exit from the cycle when we decommission the product. If we zoom in, we can see how the AVCDL phase requirements overlay onto the cyclic view. You'll note that the transition between the five developmental phases and their following phases show the phase gates that are associated with them. The topic of cyclic feedback, which is core to cyclic implementation methodologies, is described in the Understanding Cybersecurity Risk Freshness in an AVCDL Context elaboration document. We can see in the diagram on the left, the implementation phase has feedback which channels through the threat prioritization process and eventually into the issue tracking system. This feedback can return to the implementation phase directly or to the design or requirements phases. And so, although we generally have forward progress cyclically, we also have retrograde events which may be forced when issues arise. It's important to note that the adoption of a cyclic implementation methodology in a large-scale system subject to regulatory constraints requires that the system be decomposed to a level of granularity which more readily allows for this type of cyclic feedback. When creating safety-critical cyber-physical systems, we need to be able to establish traceability. Here's a portion of a diagram showing how traceability is achieved within the AVCDL. 
This diagram gives us a way to visualize how traceability can be established for any artifact within the AVCDL. The large rounded rectangles represent the various AVCDL phases. Shown here are the foundation, requirements, design, and implementation phases. At the bottom is a legend. The color coding indicates the group responsible for each of the various artifacts and activities. The dependencies are readily apparent. Consider the design gate in the design phase. To get to that point, you have to have created the attack surface analysis report, secure design review report, the threat modeling report, the ranked risk threat report, and the threat report. Then, and only then, can you say that you've completed the design phase activities. You'll notice that one line pushes back all the way through to the global security goals. Also, to be able to produce the threat modeling report, you can trace back via the connector 4, which goes back to the threat prioritization plan. Any artifact created within the AVCDL has similar traceability, so that nothing is left up to chance in terms of how it's produced, how it's consumed, and where it's come from. Here we see a typical phase requirement as shown from the AVCDL primary document. Let's look at the areas each of these phase requirements will provide. First, at the top, we see the title. It's broken down in the following areas. You'll see the section within the AVCDL, in this case 9.3.4, the phase requirements name, threat modeling, and then a unique identifier which is used both within the AVCDL documentation and also externally. In this case, this is AVCDL Design 4, which says that it's from the design phase and that it's the fourth phase requirement. Next, we have the owner section. This is broken down into two areas. The first is the group within the organization driving the requirement. In this case, it's security. It could also be development, DevOps, or risk. The second is the NCWF role. This is the cybersecurity workforce role as defined by NIST. In this case, it's the security architect. Both the group and the NCWF role have hyperlinks which take you to another section of the document providing summary information regarding the responsibilities of the group and the role. The next section is administration. This is the RACI information. The four groups of focus within the ABCDL are security, DevOps, development, and risk. In this case, we can see that security, development, and risk share responsibility for this activity. DevOps does not have any role within the context of this particular activity, and so a dash is used. The next section is the description. This contains general information regarding the activity and its application. It may also include notes that are applicable to the requirement. As we see here, the second note has a reference and link to AVCDL Foundation 9, the Threat Prioritization Plan. The next section indicates whether training for this particular phase requirement is provided. In this case, threat modeling does in fact provide training. The next area covers AVCDL internal dependencies. These are the predecessor activities that occur within the AVCDL. In this case, we see that the threat prioritization plan and applying security requirements and risk information to design are both dependencies of this phase requirement. The next area lists the external dependencies. These are dependencies on other groups within the organization. You'll note that the table shows what inputs DevOps, development, and risk are expected to provide. In this case, the DevOps and the risk groups are not expected to provide anything, but development is expected to provide an element detailed design in order for threat modeling to take place. The next area lists the products generated by the phase requirement. These are the products and artifacts that are created as a result of the activity. These are linked to secondary documents, which provide specific information as to the processes necessary to produce the artifacts. In this case, we can see that a threat modeling report, a ranked risk threat report, and a threat report 
are the artifacts which are created as a result of this phase requirement activity. The next area shows the 21434 required work products. These are the work products specified in the 21434 applicable to this phase requirement. The next area covers the UN R155 CSMS requirements. As with the 21434 work products, these are the requirements specifically fulfilled by the phase requirement. This next section covers the CSMS supplemental information. These are the R155 requirements which we believe are supported by this phase requirement, but for which there is no direct connection. Finally, are the CMMC applicable practices. Each of the five CMMC levels and their applicable best practices are listed. Within each of the AVCDL secondary documents, the process's workflow is decomposed into a series of activities. In this case, what we're looking at is threat modeling. Within the threat modeling process, we undertake three individual activities, threat model creation, threat model analysis, and threat candidate triage. As you can see here, we call out the actors that are participating, the inputs, and the outputs. Additionally, we have optional feedback that may lead to updating the threat model itself. Once the triage activity is complete, the final artifact is fed into the threat ranking process. The secondary documents that include these workflows have a lot to say about these activities and what motivates them. They cover information like, here's what you do, these are the people required, the system design looks like this, and these are the factors which drive the activity forward or back. And lastly, these are the artifacts and reports and how they're structured. As you might imagine, each of the documents within the AVCDL compresses a lot of information into a small space. Each of the documents provides a section labeled references, which point to the materials used in the creation of that document, as well as additional sources of information which elaborate on the subject matter. Now let's do a quick summary of the AVCDL documents that are available. In the lower left-hand corner, you'll notice the URL for the AVCDL GitHub repository. Of course, the AVCDL primary document is available. To go along with the primary document is a set of working material which were used both in the construction of the primary document and the secondary documents. Now these take the form of Excel spreadsheets typically, but they may also just be reference documents which condense information not used in the documents themselves. The secondary documents cover each of the AVCDL phase requirement products. Since supply chain cybersecurity is of such importance, a set of documents has been written specifically to address such areas as the Cybersecurity Interface Agreement, the Manufacturer's Disclosure Statement, the cybersecurity maturity of the processes of the supplier organization, as well as how to map established processes into AVCDL processes. Additionally, there are a set of templates and forms to be completed in the establishment of agreements and the gathering of evaluation information. Finally, there are a set of blog posts and elaboration documents. The blog posts provide a gentle introduction to the AVCDL. These are generally targeted at management and decision makers. The elaboration documents provide information on general subjects such as software bill of materials, open source, and how various processes such as risk freshness and the overall supply chain fit into an AVCDL context. One of the strengths of the AVCDL is that it's undergone third-party review and assessment from its inception. It was intended that the AVCDL be able to provide support for organizations attaining certification under various technical and regulatory standards. This is the timeline of the AVCDL assessment. Work on the AVCDL began in January of 2020. In May of that year, discussions began with two sued with the intent of them performing an assessment. 19 months later, in November 2021, the assessment began. 
The assessment for 21434 took eight months. During that time, feedback was provided by TUBE, and the AVCDL updated to reflect that feedback. In June of 2022, the AVCDL was assessed as being compliant with ISO SAE 21434, excluding those elements which are the sole responsibility of the organization, things such as project management and quality management systems. In August of that same year, it was determined that 26262 did not have sufficient cybersecurity-related material to be able to establish a statement of compliance. Work then progressed to prepare for the UN R155 assessment, which began in January of 2023. In June of 2023, after addressing TUBE's feedback, the AVCDL was assessed as compliant with R155, again, excluding those elements which are the responsibility of the organization, and additionally, excluding those elements which are the sole responsibility of the OEM. These are very specific responsibilities, such as reporting to the regulator, tracking registrations of vehicles, and things which fall outside the general realm of product cybersecurity. It's worthwhile noting that if you're an organization which has not done a 21434 or UNR 155 certification, that you seriously consider the amount of time that such a review is going to require and ensure that this is built into any product release schedule you have. All AVCDL materials, both in source and distribution forms, are available on our GitHub site, as shown here. Because of the size of the repository, it's recommended that you either clone the repository or download a zip archive of it if you're not familiar with using Git. Instructions for downloading a zip archive are linked to on the repository's front page. The idea of a thousand pages of documentation and a hundred documents may seem daunting. And so there's a training path that's been established to allow you to look at a particular function you'd like to take and determine which specific secondary documents are going to feed into those activities. For instance, if you wanted to learn about secure decommissioning, the recommended path would be to start with the AVCDL overview training, then to take training on both handling PII and secure deployment, and finally, to take the secure decommissioning training. Here are the references to the source material used in the creation of this presentation. They'll also be included in the video description. Additionally, this presentation source material will be provided on the AVCDL GitHub repository.